My name is Alvaro. I'm here, I'm a software developer, probably as most of you here. Today my talk sounds very technical, but don't worry, it's not that, there is not that much math into it. And it's a little bit of a personal journey of myself and the team of how we change how to solve certain problems that we faced on our daily lives. So there is this famous sentence by this guy, well, it's attributed to this guy, it's not even very clear that it's his line, that if you have a hammer, it seems that everything is a nail. So you try to use always the same way to solve the, same, the different kind of problems. That problem is applied, I guess, to everyone in all professions, and we as developers are no different. We have like the same kind of problems. So what are the tools that us as software developers that we have? Well, the tools that we have usually is for loops, if else, has tables, lists. If you are in the functional side of the world, map, reduce, sips, recursion, whatever you name it, or Kubernetes, which is also one of those tools that you need to use for everything nowadays. <laughs> so let's go first. I will talk to I will talk about two problems that we have faced and how we changed the problem. This is some kind of pseudo Go code. We have a very common problem that everybody can have. It's like, how do you calculate a unique, how many unique elements do you have in a list? Like, well, it's usually called cardinality. So we have this code here. I receive in my function a list of IDs. Can it be IDs of my users, of purchases, something that I need to count how many unique I have. So a very common approach will be I create a table in memory, a hash table. I iterate through all those IDs. I put them into this table. And at the end, I count how many do I have in this table. And that's their solution. There are many optimizations and changes of this function, but more or less, it's some solution that any of us could probably write if you had this problem. And it works, and it will probably work for many, many cases, and it can be a perfect solution. But in some cases, what if we have many, many elements, many like millions? Does it fit into memory? Well, nowadays, memory, it's pretty big. We have gigabytes of memory, but usually your process needs to live with so many other processes into the machine. So can you store many, many elements? Well, it's a problem. And what if it's a stream? I'm getting the data on real time all the time. How do I calculate if I have, a, like in the previous example, do I need to keep that table or hash in memory for how long? And even worse, imagine that the problem that you need to calculate is different time windows. I need to calculate the unique elements of today and last week, of this week and this month. So do I need to have a table for this month, a table for this week, a table for today? It starts to be pretty difficult to scale that one. And as that data that I have in memory is pretty big, so what happens if my process is killed? How do I... Do I need to go back and start again? How do I persist that? Or I am a distributed environment. I'm getting some of the events in this machine. I'm getting those events in some other machine. It's kind of difficult. There are many possible solutions to this. One, you can outsource the problem to an external database. You can use MapReduce. You can use S3 to store the, to store the, to persist the data, but still, it complicates things a lot and might not be the perfect solution. So we can go back one step and say, hey, this cardinality that we need to calculate, does it really need to be 100% accurate? Do you need an exact number? In many cases, you might need it. Maybe you are billing and you need to bill to the cent. Maybe you can have small error and it's acceptable. So if you accept that small error, there are solutions. So what are the solutions? So meet this hyperlock lock it has this really fancy name and it's an algorithm designed for really big data sets, like big in the sense that more than millions. And 
it's really nice because it has constant memory usage. It only uses a very few kilobytes of memory. So you might be wondering how can you keep that in mind, how can you count with very few kilobytes if we are talking about millions of elements? But there is a price to pay. The price to pay is this error that you need to accept. And the error in this problem is usually less than 2%, which is a very small error, but you need to first analyze if your use case will allow that error or not. And I think it's very interesting how this algorithm work. I'm going to try to explain on the high level without going into very big details because it's a mind change. So imagine that we have this amazing coin. We have all played throwing the coins. So how likely is to get two heads in a row? So you throw a coin, it's a completely random event or it should be random event unless you have a cheated coin. So you have to throw it. I want to, get, I want to know how likely it is to get two heads in a row. So, well, there are two possible states. The head or the other side of the coin. So there are two states and I want two events. So I have two, two, two squared, two to the power of two states. So it means that the chances of me getting two heads in a row is one in four. That's pretty easy. We probably all went through these things on high school. And what about if I want to get 10 heads in a row? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated, more difficult to get because I still have two states. But now I want 10 events. So it's 2 to the power of 10. So it means that my chances of getting 10 heads in a row, it's 1,024. But it's a little bit more difficult. So this so simple concept is what it's built on the hyperlock lock. But instead of counting a head or tails, we are going to count a group of zeros. We have an ID. Let's put an example. Let's imagine that we have this ID. It's one of the IDs of a user that is logging into our web, our web service or purchase or whatever you name it that you need to count. So we have this ID. Imagine this one, two, three, four, blah, blah, zero. And we are going to count how many groups of zero, how long is the group of zeros that we have in that ID. In this example, you can see that there is only one zero, so one of it. What about this ID? Well, in this one, we can see that there are two zeros on the, on, on the ID. So what does this really mean? So, we saw before the example of how likely it is to get heads in a row. So let's do the same, but instead of counting heads, we said zeros. So how likely it is to get zeros in this ID? Well, now instead of two states, we have 10. We have 10 digits from zero to nine. So we have 10 states. We want to get one zero, so it means 10 to the power of one. So we can make a rough estimate that if we have seen an ID that has one zero, it means that we have pretty good chances that we have seen around 10 IDs. And this is a simple concept that is built on the whole algorithm. And in the second case, we have, we have two zeros. So the chances of is 10 to the power of two. So the chances that we see an ID with two zeros, it means that we probably have seen around 100 of IDs getting. So this is what the whole algorithm works. Instead of really keeping in memory the IDs, we are just going to count chances of seeing these IDs. Well, of course, there is a little bit more magic behind it. We need to put all these things together, and there is lots of maths behind it. We are not going to go through it. But on the coin example, we said that it was a completely random event. It should be random. When you throw a coin, you don't know if you are going to get one or the other. So this should be the same. And usually, your, which, which our IDs probably are not completely random, so you need to have a hash function to make sure that the space of the, that we are going to classify is random. So there is a specific hash function to be doing that. Then it uses buckets. So it's not as simple as I explained before, because imagine it's unlikely, but it's possible that the first ID that you receive has five zeros. It's as likely 
as any other ID, because well, it can be. So imagine that you get only one hit, five zeros. You will estimate that you have seen 100,000 uh, visitors. Well, it's, the error is way above the 2% that we said originally. So it uses part of the hash function to divide the space into smaller chunks. So if you see a case like this of five zeros, you will never count such a big number. So you can kind of control the space to avoid these kind of uh, outliers. And then at the end, I have many buckets. So I do kind of average. It's a little bit more complicated function. It has mean distributed mean of all the buckets. And then that final number is the answer to our question is like, what's the cardinality of a set? As you can see, it's a very simple concept. Of course, the math involved is a little bit more complicated, but it's also a quite complicated problem that you can have, which is count the cardinality of really big data sets. So what are the benefits? Well, there are plenty of benefits. One, I say, is low and constant memory. It's usually around kilobytes of memory, which is compared to gigabytes that we can be talking. Well, it's big, big difference, which means that if I need to persist these few kilobytes, it's way easier to persist a few kilobytes than gigabytes of data. As I don't need to keep the IDs in memory, it means that I can now have stream, data streaming. I don't need to keep my window all day, during my window, all the data there. So I can add new data to my hyperlog log as I want. And even better, it can be combined. So maybe the example I was saying before, I want to calculate daily unique users, weekly unique users, and monthly. So now I only can keep daily ones, and if you ask me, day weekly. So I get the last seven days, and I can combine, because combining a hyperlog log, it means for every bucket I go, I take the maximum of each of the buckets, and then I calculate the average, like the mean of all of those at the end. So I can combine as many hyperlog logs as I, as I want. So I can make also distributed, meaning I have one hyperlog log in this microservice somewhere here, I have another one there, and at the end I just want to put all this together. So all I need to do is give me the information of the buckets and calculate all those means, and I have the magic number already there. So, and even better is, the idea is very simple, implementation as always, it's a little bit more complicated, but you don't need to worry because there are many, many implementations already available in pretty much almost every language, Java, uh, Go, and even that, even more than that, many databases are problem, uh, already implemented. So if you have the data in a database, you can already use it, and let's see, uh, let's see it working. I have this small Go program. What we are going to do is we are going to generate this code here. The rest is pretty much the boilerplate to get it to work. We are make, going to make a for loop. We are going to generate a random string, a string only length four. So let's see if we can get some collisions out of it. And then we are going to add, do things. This is not really needed but this, for the demo, we are going to use Redis. Probably, I guess, most of you know what Redis is. It's a key value store. So we are going to add these IDs that we are going to generate into a set, which is kind of a list in Redis terms. And then we are going to use here the hyperlog log. And at the end, we are going to print the estimation of how good or bad our estimate is. So let's run it here. So we run this, takes a few seconds because it's not really optimized and it adds many, instead of many at once, it does one at a time. So see, we have, out of the 10,000 that we generated, we had eight the same. So we, this is the real number that we, unique that we generate. The estimate of the hyperlog log is this number. So it means that we had 62 items that were miscounted. But what is the error rate? Well, we have a 0 0.6 error rate, which is really, really low, which it means that in many problems, you can probably accept this small error. And we can go to Redis because you can, oops, sorry, you can go to Redis directly. 
let's see, we can, this is the command that is going directly to Redis. It's like, okay, give me the estimate, which is exactly the same number because it's the Go program is getting this number. But I can go, which is this what I added. This is the list exactly of all the items that were generated. As you can see, the number matches because there are 9,992 9, items. So with this very simple one instructions to Redis, you can add here more than one at a, at a time. You can use this to count the cardinality of a set without needing to worry about gigabytes and gigabytes of memory. So very simple demo, but I think it's nice to see it on real life that, and as I said, we use it in production. So we use this on our daily lives because we said, okay, we can accept this small error for the savings that it creates on our infrastructure, on our coding of, of maintenance and everything. And as I said, there are two cases that I want to talk about today. This Ah, sorry, before going that one, I talk about the hyperlock lock as this approximate algorithm, but there are many, many more to, to solve uh, many other problems. So for example, do you want to calculate quantiles? Well, there is an algorithm for that, also approximate. Do you want to calculate histograms? There is also uh, estim uh, approximate algorithms to do histograms. Do you want to have this top K a problem which means it's kind of similar to the cardinality, but instead of counting unique, I want to see what's my top 10 of my top 100. It will be similar. You will need to keep all of them in memory and then count, but there is an algorithm also to approximate those. And if you, go, if you Google many of them, are, you can easily find them by like streaming or real time, and you can find many, many others, and many of them are already already implemented also in many common databases. So if you accept errors and approximations, statistics are really, really powerful. And as I was saying, I wanted to talk about two different cases. This is completely different one. Uh, let's imagine that we want to have some resource allocation. This is a real problem that we had in our team. And this is a little bit of the story how we we're able to solve. Initially, we have some resource, we have some users. Let's put that it's kind of a promotion. We have a promotion that we want to give to certain users. Initially, as always, we started as simple as you can be. I pretty much it was the first come first serve or randomly I assign to my users. But then one day the product owner comes and say, hey, yeah, well, it's nice. But what about if the user hasn't done this, should not get this promotion? Oh, sure, no worries. We add if this, do this. Okay, easy. Next day, he comes and asks it, ask for that again. And week after, another condition. And another week after, another condition. And how do you end up? Well, you end up in an if-else nightmare spaghetti code that nobody can understand, nobody can test and it's impossible to manage. So we took a step back and say, okay, how can we approach this problem from a completely different angle? So we decided, hey, probably, probabilistic approach. So we have all seen probably this formula. Don't worry, it's the only formula that we have today here. So what's the probability of having that probability of A and B happening? Well, is the probability of A and times the probability of B condition to A. But let's simplify. We are going to assume that A and B are completely independent. So let's say that the probability of A and B is the product of the probability of A and the probability of B. And how does this work? Well, we are going to change the name instead of probability, let's call it score. So for all the resources that we have, we are going to calculate a score, the score of this resource to these users. Sounds simple, we calculate a score. Then we sort of all the scores of all this that we have calculated, and we choose the top one, two, three, whatever you want to be solving. So, sounds simple, but what is the score? Well, we say 
we were talking about probability. So a score, it's for each of the rules that we want to have, it's a function that returns zero to one, like a probability. And then at the end, we just multiply all of them as we saw in the example of the probability A and B. So we multiply of all of them and that's the score of this function. It sounds pretty abstract, but you can way easier see it on example. Imagine that we, the resource that we want to assign, we have a user that has money on their account. The, the resource that we want to assign has some value. So why don't we, the users that have more or less the same amount of money that the cost of the resource that we want to assign, probably are the most likely to buy. Probably not, or maybe not, who knows? So we write a function that says, okay, between zero and one, what's the, how close those two values are? And we return it. Or maybe you can even filter completely. If user A is, if user A can buy it, other users, type user or groups, or, sorry, users of type A can buy it. The other ones will return a zero, which means they cannot buy it completely. We can filter. We still have if else's, but it simplifies the code a lot. Or you can go very fancy and base, okay, I want that the probability increases with the time that they have been in service because I want to control the churn or how inventive you can be. So this is an example of how you can write things on terms of probability or a score, as we call it. So what is the, are the benefits? Well, the code becomes much simpler. You have functions that you can test. You can read them much easily. You can change them really easy on the fly. And even better, you can have it that they adapt automatically. But how can they adapt automatically? Well, we can write more functions. So what about if we, instead of these more static functions that we had as a scoring, we have a new one that is like, okay, let's measure how my users are reacting to this allocation that I'm having. So I'm say my resource have been shown to my users X amount of times. Did they react to it or not? So this is real time that you can be getting from other place. So with that, you are already putting a feedback from real time into your allocation algorithm because the rate of your users reacting to those resources is going to change the allocation itself, which is really, really nice. Or imagine that the value of your resource might be changing with time because maybe the first week is more expensive but it decreases with time, who knows? So you can even put the value of the resource that you, or how much money am I getting? Is the resources that are more, ex I get more revenue, maybe I want to put more priority in those than the other ones. So I can add that into my formula to allocate those resources. And if we are going to put real data into the algorithm, it kind of sounds strange, but if I just put a new resource, how that resource will be allocated. Because we have just said that, hey, we have this division here, resource consumption divided by resource impressions. But if it's a new one, it will be zero. It will not work at all. So how can we solve this? Well, there, are very, there is one very easy solution. Why don't we split the allocations in two groups? One uses the algorithm. 90% of the cases, let's say 90, you can decide the number by yourself. Let's say that 90% of the cases, we use the, this new fancy probabilistic allocation system. And the rest, let's assign it completely random. Any resource out of the ones that we have, we allocate it completely random. And with those random, it will be already gathering data to fit our formulas for the allocation system. And this that sounds so easy and simple, which is like I divide between two groups, it's called epsilon greedy, which is a pretty fancy name for a machine learning, reinforced learning. So if you implement this as simple as it sounds, 
you can already say, hey, we have machine learning in our product. We have reinforced learning. So everybody can put that into their marketing slides and everybody will be happy. But it's as simple as that. You just need to divide your set 10% completely random, but I'm already feeding that information into my allocation engine. So with that very simple case, I can already adjust my, my allocation based on real time. And again, let's see, whoa, I'm going really fast. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna have so much time at the end. So let's see a demo. So try to explain it with real code. Let me change that, okay. So imagine that we have this user. It's a user that has some money and there is a type of user. And then we have a resource that there is a value of that resource, meaning the price. We are going to count how many times the user has consumed it, how many times have we printed to the user, and let's give it a name. And then for the sake of the demo, of course, you will not have this on, real, on your real one. We need to kind of mimic users clicking that resource. So when we create the resource, we are going to put a CTR or a click-through rates, which will be used to calculate these consumptions. But of course, this on real product, this is just for the sake of the demo, which is implemented here. So we have a resource, and if I want to use the resource, I increase the number of impressions, and if the, some random number is less than this CTR, I will count it as the user has clicked on it. Otherwise, it's just shown, but the user didn't click on it. But because if you know ads on the internet, the click-through rates are really, really low, less than 10% most of the cases. So then, uh, I'm going, let's create some random user which has some random type and some random money on their account. And then we can create also with the same way random resources. So how does this work? We said before, we have functions here, the score functions. This is pretty much the same that I have on the slides. Let's calculate the money. I, let's, the closer that the user money is as close as possible to the amount of the, the price of the resource, I assume that it's more likely the user to buy it. Is it true or not? That's a different discussion. I need to normalize it so it's more or less between zero and one. In some cases, even for us in production, we don't use even zero to one. In some of our functions, we don't, that's why we don't call it probability, because in some cases we go even above zero, I mean above one. And it usually doesn't even break the algorithm because as we are not counting alg um, probability, it doesn't really break anything. And we don't have any mathematician in the team that can scream about those cases. So we have another function that if the, if the user is type A and the resource is random, I don't want them to buy it because the product owner says that they are not eligible for whatever reason. This is the real time that I said before. We have the consumptions, we have the impressions, and we just divide them. And we just take into account, of course, we don't want to divide by zero. So in case that we have never printed, we just say, and then the value, because we want to prioritize the resources that are more expensive, because the company says that we need to sell the expensive stuff because we get more money out of course. So how do we do that? So we just calculate the score. We have a list of the functions here, and we just iterate uh, those functions, and we just <laughs> multiply. So as easy as this for loop, we iterate all the functions, and we apply them with the user that we have and the resource that we have. You can become here as creative as you want, but uh, don't be too creative and adding too much too many functions, otherwise the algorithm will have so much noise that it will not really work out. So you cannot go overboard. And then what are we going to do? So let's go here. In the end, this is the real thing. So uh, what we are going to do, 
we are going to create a random user, then I said part of the cases we are going to do randomly, and the other ones is going to be using the allocation engine. So we, cal we check here. Are we in the random or in the allocation? Oh, we are in the random. So we just choose one random out of the one, and we use it. Otherwise, we iterate all the resources, we calculate the score for each resource, and we just keep the maximum out of this. In this example, we are going to use only one, the first one. So we just keep the maximum, and at the end, the max resource that we have used, we just consume it. So how does this work on real time? So it's random, so let's hope that the random part works as beautifully as possible. So we run it. As you can see here, there are three resources. This is the cheap one, expensive, and the deal. The deal is a great deal that users cannot refuse. So at the beginning, the cheap one was the best one allocated by the system because it's the first one, and it started like that. It's kind of random, but as you can see, the, use, the users start to, started to buy the great deal because it's the best deal ever. So the system, as you can see, it's pretty much all the time already allocating the best one because I know that the chances of my users buying is, is that one. Still, it keeps trying the other ones every now and then, but the system already decided that, hey, my users are buying this one most of the time. So why I'm going to offer them something that is less likely for my company. So, but what about if I add a random one? So I just created a new random one. As you can see, the algorithm starts to adapt automatically. It seems that this random was a great deal also. We had pretty good luck because in my preparation, sometimes it was completely the opposite, but <laughs> it's random, so that's what it takes. So. It's random, it decided that they, these random users are reacting even much better than the original great deal that we had. So the system automatically adapts to it and starts assigning the users the new random element. And I can create another random and let's see. The, in this blue here, it sees the consumption. It means how many times the users are consuming our resource. This, the red one, is the, the impressions that we are having of our resource. And the bottom is just for the sake of kind of giving context, is what's the price of that resource in cents. So you need to kind of divide it by 100. So as you can see, it's really easy algorithm, and it can solve a very complicated problem, which is allocating resources, and even with the kind of the cherry on the top, you can apply automatic out optimization of your algorithm and all of that just by adding some kind of <laughs> concepts of probability. And we can restart it because sometimes <coughs> it takes longer or so. And one thing also important to know this epsilon greedy, you have this, I think now it's 80, 80 20 in this demo, if I remember right. But this 80 and 20, 80 20 or 90 10, you can change it however you want. Depends on your use case and depends on what problem you are trying to solve. The more random one, it adapts faster, but then you kind of are less greedy in a sense that you kind of try to squeeze less out of your users, or you can even change it on the fly, meaning that if you have pretty static content that you are allocating, maybe for the first three days, I have a very big random part, but as days pass, I decrease the random to a very small part, or even I can put it to zero. Everything just follows the allocation engine, which I'm trying to maximize my value. But if you have many new content appearing all the time, you want to test that content probably more often. So maybe you want to change how the algorithm adapts, even by changing the division between randomness and non-randomness. So that's it of it. And 
I hope it was clear. Do you have any questions about the code or the demo? No? Good. OK. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> well, I wrote it in Go mostly because this is the language that I use nowadays most, so it's the easiest one for me to write. You can write it in pretty much any language. But I agree that, for example, these functions of applying the score to resources with map maps, it fits even much nicer. You can write all those all that code in a much at least cleaner code point of view. But that, again, it depends on what technologies or whatever you need to use. But the same concept applies to both. <coughs> yep? Is there any place where we can find the statistical tools more of them? Than well, I haven't found one place that you can see them. You need to Google. My trick, usually, if I need to solve any problem, and you have big, you can Google by streaming and the problem that you are trying to solve because many of these problems really happen when you have really big data or a streaming problem. Because if you have a stream of data, it gets pretty complicated. For example, the cardinality that we were talking before. Uh, if you don't have in the function that I put at the very beginning, it's easy. I get the IDs, I give the result. But if I have a stream of data, I get users all the time on my web service or my application or my game or whatever. How do I calculate that? I don't have the set right now. I'm getting it at the time that I want to calculate. So those problems usually, if you Google by the streaming and the problem that you are trying to solve, you might have good chances of, of finding something. Well, we don't manage, we just, at least for us, is we say, okay, our, our statistics or like our counts are going to have this error. And when you are in such big numbers, usually errors are pretty acceptable. Of course, it depends on, again, your use case. Even in billing, I know some companies that are using approximate methods, even for billing. They say, okay, I'm, I'm billing hundreds of thousands, of, of euros to my clients. I even, I know that I have 1% of error, it might be the 1% is on more or less. So what they decided is, okay, 1%, I make a discount of 1% of the, because they bill per user. So they say, okay, I count the amount of users that I have, and I know that I have a rare error of 1%. For us, it's, for them, in that case, it was so much easier. We are losing 1% of revenue, but we save thousands of euros in implementation, in development time, and everything. So every time they say, okay, I have one million users, I discount 1%, and then that number use it for the billing. So they maybe they are giving two, up to 2% discount to the companies because it can be that it's on top of a error. We was already 1% below, and they are making another 1%. To that, so it means that they are making two percent discount to the users, but it still is worthy for them because they are saving huge amount of cost in many other areas. So in the end, it depends on culture of the company. It depends on what you are trying to achieve, and many things. So, so it's I think many times it's more cultural problem than really actual coding or product problem. But it depends, of course, on the problem. So. If, let's go back for a sec. So, so at least what I would like you to get out of this talk is that, hey, you don't need 100% accuracy always. It's a mind, it's a, something that you need to change how we think. It took me some time to also say, hey, 
why do I always need to have this? So it's a mindset that you need to change. And I hated probability and statistics when I was at university. It was the worst tool. I hated to go through those. Finally, after many years working, well, I had to re-study, and I see now the beauty of this one. They are really, really helpful. You don't need to learn the theorems as we used to learn at university. Many cases, basics, how to understand things is already more than enough to be able to solve problems in a completely different way. Like this resource allocation, as probably we did, many of you will go the same of this if, else, and things like that. And just using probability changed everything completely, and it gave us even this automatic machine learning, whatever you want to call it, buzzword, to optimize that. So those small changes are really, really important, and even the accuracy. And as I said, many of them are already implemented. As I said, this epsilon greedy has many, many names, like this multi-armed bandit. And if you Google those, you will see that there are many implementations of those already available also. So that's it. So thank you very much. If you have more questions, then I'm happy. And I'll be around here today and tomorrow, so you can come and ask any questions. I speak Spanish also, so you can speak Spanish. <laughs> so thank you very much.